People can, you know, judge you off of the first 30 seconds of meeting you, right? And so image becomes important. So in, in that example, when I talked about, you know, being a member of trying to get into, you know, Delta Sigma Theta, did I, you know, fit the mold of what they were representing on campus, right? You know, was I, and you know, was I representing the values of that particular organization? Did I fit the culture? What does E stand for? So as you progress, you're gonna need some mentors and I'm introducing a concept called sponsors, people that will have your back, people that are decision makers, that when they're talking about you in the room, they have the power politically to be able to say, you know what, I believe in Tony and I think that we should give him that scholarship. Or I believe in Tierra. We actually, you know, were in class together. She was part of my, you know, um, she was one of my students. And I believe that, you know, she should become a member or she should get that, you know, that summer job. It's important that people know the work that you're doing. So P stands for? I stands for? And E stands for? So merit isn't enough. Make sense? So when the, the principal is talking about these academics not being up to par, right? We have so many other things that we need to work on that grades shouldn't be the thing that hold, holds us back, right? All right, top quiz. What do all of these things have in common? So you have the Twitter logo, Facebook, Netflix, YouTube, Smart, Phone, Google, okay, I'm hearing, what's your name? Arno? Social media. Social media? Don't be shy. Okay, who, who has another answer? Huh? Labels? Labels, okay. Brands? Any other guests? Networks. Networks, institutions? Money. Money, yes. So, all of you guys are correct, but the reason why I put this on you, none of these brands existed when I graduated high school. None of these brands existed when Wi-Fi, YouTube, there was no smartphone, none of that. Not even Google. When I, I graduated, I know I look young, but I graduated in 2000. None of these brands existed. We had beepers, the smartphone, that's what I'm talking about. We had cell phones, but not the smartphone. All right? So bring me to the next slide. All right, these are, okay now, these are, these are job titles. All right, you have ride sharing drivers, app developer, user experience designers, social media manager, SEO specialist. Anybody have a clue what these things have in common? You back there? The question is, these job descriptions, these job titles, what do they all have in common? You can make a lot of money, okay. Any other answers? None of these jobs existed when I graduated college. None of these jobs existed when I graduated college. So the point that I'm making here is, which is the next slide, is that you have to keep up with the future. I graduated from college over 10 years ago with my bachelor's, and the world is changing. There was no Uber, there was no SEO optimization, there was no app developers because the smartphone was actually introduced by Apple in 2007. The world is changing around us and we have to make sure that we're keeping up with this. So even myself, you know, I don't want to get stale. So I, I want to give you some resources. Write this down. www. Y'all should know that. 
www.udemy.com. Udemy.com. U D E U as in umbrella, D as in dog, E as in elephant, M as in Marie, Y as in yellow. Dot com. I'm old school. So basically, this is a website where you can go on, and if like one of the, the changes that I was a PC user all of, you know in college and you know the first eight years of my career. So moving out here, I got a Mac, and the Excel formulas, you know are very different on a Mac versus an Apple. So I had to learn, relearn. So write this down. Unlearn, learn, <laughs> unlearn, learn, and relearn. Unlearn, learn, and relearn, all right? So I'm giving you guys this as a resource so that if you want, take, take the power in your own hands in terms of getting the education you need. It's a great website where you can get a lot of tools, it's, you know, video instructions for, a lot of the classes are $10. Invest. Open to ideas, so that may be an idea for her to invest in y'all, those classes. Okay. Okay. All right, who likes money? I know I love money, okay? I love nice things. Dr. Maisha Griggs, you know, she was talking about how, you know, she, she likes to drive nice cars and things like that. We may all have, you know, what we want to spend our money on, but you know what? We were talking about this in the room. My parents did not sit down and talk to me about money, but that's no excuse. There's more resources and information at our fingertips than our parents had. So these are three books that really changed my life. When I was graduating college, I had a 500 credit score. Y'all probably don't know what credit scores are, but they will become very important later on in life. All right? And the first book I read that changed the trajectory of my life and my finances was this book by Susie Orman, The Young, Fabulous, and Broke. I encourage y'all, Check it out, go on Amazon, buy this 10 bucks, invest in yourself. Think and Grow Rich, when you're in college, I want you to pick that book up. And the one, so Tiffany the Budgetista is a, a African American woman that is just changing the world with her message. She has a free, you know, online course that you can um, take and it's Live Richer Challenge. Write that down. Live Richard Challenge, Tiffany the Budgetista. Look her up. Money talks and it's important. And so the lesson learned along the way is to ensure that you get your finances together at a very early age. Think about, I know that sometimes, you know, we're thinking about the here and now and how we're gonna eat, but you know, I think about the 60 and 65 year old Rochelle and how I want her to live. And so both these resources will help you. Next slide. And then the last thing is, it, yes, it may even happen to you. On the left, his and hers. Listen now, his and hers. The reality is, you know, it's not projected until 2056 where men and women will have pay equality, all right? Then you have this woman over here. Do y'all remember this story on the right? Yeah, she said that she's a black consumer. Oh, yeah, that's Stacy I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this woman, she she basically, do y'all remember that story? Y'all was too, too busy face looking. Uh, no, she took down the Confederate flag, okay? There's the, there's the new N-word. People, you know, what our parents and my, our parents' parents had to face, we're not facing that type of discrimination and racism anymore. It's really complicated. And then you even have some of your own people that just don't get it, like Miss Stacy Dash over here. All right? My whole point in telling you this is, I remember, 
I was 24 years old, coming into work, new manager, and he says to me in my one-on-one, I'm a redneck from Missouri. That's how he introduced me to the group, okay? And he did everything to, tr to try to destroy me. But you know what, through you know, the ups and downs, I believe that there was no excuses. My parents were counting on me, I was counting on myself, and I believed in myself. Stand up. I know I'm giving y'all a workout, but this is something that you guys can affirm to yourself when you're hearing negative messages in the world. I want you to say, excuses are tools of incompetence. Excuses are tools of incompetence. That build monuments of nothing. Those that dwell upon them are seldom good at anything. It is best to be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. All right, Buccaneers, let's do it. Thank you. Old school, we old school, we gotta go Gen Y, we gotta go baby boomer, put your phones up, we going back to house rule number three. House rule number three says no electronics, put them up before I bring the next speaker up. So if you, you better get that last text message sent. I know, so get out a pen and paper, because just like this is class, we're here at fourth period, this is fourth period. It's homeroom. You don't get to have your phone in homeroom. Let's quickly put our phones up. Quickly put our phones up. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you, if you can hear me, clap three times. So we're going to bring our next speaker up. Thank you, guys. So our next speaker, if you've taken a look at the program, is Mr. Darren Palmer, who currently is the program manager at the Felton Institute, but has such a, a wide variety of experiences that he's going to talk to you guys about today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the floor to him. Thank you, Dr. We truly appreciate that. Can we turn off the lights a little bit? I'm going to see if I can. Okay, great. Uh, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to each and every one of the, the mighty Balboa Buccaneers who have been so gracious as to extend hospitality, warmth, and encouragement to each and every one of us as speakers. Because as you can well imagine, most of us are pretty nervous when we get in front of them. And if you know what it means to be nervous, you have been in my shoes and I had been in your shoes. 1967, well let's start before that, 1953, December 14th of 1953, I came into this world, right here in San Francisco, California, the city by the bay. My name is Derek Tolliver, come from the Tolliver family. We talk about brands, whatever your last name is, that is your brand. You represent your brand. Google, which is now what, Alphabet, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, spend billions, millions, or billions of dollars promoting and protecting the brand. Every time you get on public transportation, you walk the streets of San Francisco, you are promoting your brand. So what do people think about your brand? Think about it. What image are you giving to those people who don't know you, but see you? See, that's what you gotta think about when you walk and leave this room. You know, you see I have two things in my hand. 
One is a, uh, something you're all familiar with, right? Everybody knows what this is, right? Okay. Put this in my pocket. I'm going to show you what I take to most of my meetings. This. Most of you know what this is, right? Okay. Born in 1953, mother came from West Monroe, Louisiana. Got here about 1947, about the age of 12. My father came from Jefferson, Texas. So I'm a first generation San Francisco. My father came here, he was 19 years old. He went to one year of college, Wiley. My mother graduated from Girls High School, which was an old Benjamin Franklin High School in San Francisco. Anybody know where that is? What is that now? Dr. Gray is, uh, Kip. is Kip? Kip. Kip. So it's Kip now. So you know where that is in Western Edition of Fillmore. So when I, when my parents got married, uh, I was born in the Western Edition. First place I lived, we didn't call it Western Edition, they didn't call it Fillmore. Right in the mall. Right? That's where I was born. Okay? And I lived there until I was about six years old. Our first high school, uh, elementary school I went to was John Muir. How many people know where John Muir is? On Webster Street. And then I went to uh, Anza, which is now Wallenberg. Then our family got an opportunity. Listen to this. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit. They got an opportunity to get a job. Father in 1960 became one of the early police officers in San Francisco. If I know about Mario Woods, you know about what's happening. My father was back there in 1960 when they didn't hardly have any blacks on the police force. And he came on board with undercover narcotics for about a year and a half to two years in San Francisco. What kind of crazy stuff is that? Everybody in San Francisco knew. Chances are knew who he was. But he, that's where they assigned him. Okay. My mother, only with a high school education, became the fourth woman ever hired by the San Francisco Police Department. She became the first African American meter maid in the history of San Francisco. They got sisters giving you tickets everywhere now. Okay. But my mother was the first. 1963. I'm talking about a long time ago, right? I'm talking about over 50 years ago. I'm 62, okay? I'm 62 years old. So, what I want to tell you is that when I went to high school, I got there through what I told you, John Muir, Anson, which is Wallenberg, moved over to this station valley when my parents were in this That's why I told you that was a story. And then, I went to Visitation Valley Elementary School because they didn't have a Visitation Valley Middle School then. And then I went to Luther Burbank. Because we be this. We know what's going on, right? Went to Luther Burbank, which is now Jim Jordan, a couple of other schools there. And then I graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School. I was a boy. Green and gold. All day. Okay? But let me tell you something. This campus that you're sitting on right now changed my life. I repeat, this campus that we're standing, sitting here on right now changed my life. I started off this presentation talking about 1967. 1967, I was 13 years old. And in 1967, there was a coach here I was running track. I didn't know anything about track. I was trying to learn track. I was only 13 years old. And I joined the PAL, Police Athletic League. At that time, the police wouldn't just shoot me down. They were actually helping in the community with young people, providing sports activities, paying for us to go to track meets and travel out to Stockton and, you know, Fresno, Modesto. And they had a track out here at Balboa High School track, where they invited all the students and athletes throughout the city to come out here and work out during the summertime. And you had a coach here at Balboa named George White. Mm -hmm. Now remember, I didn't go to Woodrow Wilson High School. But when I was at Burbank, 13 years old, George White helped coach me. But here's the deal. I became really good friends with about four, five, six athletes from Balboa. And they took me under their wing, like their little brother. And they helped coach me. And I became number two in the United States in high jump 
at 13 years old. I traveled to New York City representing San Francisco for the first United States Youth Games. Okay? And I say that because you don't know where your blessings going to come from. I couldn't even jump when I got here. But brothers from Balboa and that coach from Balboa took this little black kid named Derek Tolliver and said, don't get discouraged. You can't even make the bar and it's this low. I couldn't jump over it. But when they finished with me, I was jumping over the bar this high. And that was about as tall as I was. And when I went back to New York City and I'm standing up there and there's somebody from San Juan, Puerto Rico, somebody from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, somebody from Atlanta, Georgia, somebody from New York City, Detroit, Chicago. I had heard about these places in New Orleans. But I had never seen kids from all those places in one spot. And here I am from San Francisco, and i got to figure out how I'm going to compete. And it's, we're on Randall's Island, it's burning up hot in the summertime, and I'm in a high jump representing my city. The only way I got there was because of Balboa High School. Okay? So you have a special significance to me. Now let's fast forward. I was in the track, you know that. Uh, I got into school, student politics. I became president of my elementary school. I was in my church, Jones Methodist Church in San Francisco. So my parents had me involved in a lot of different activities. And I didn't always want to do it. I got involved in one activity around Balboa. How many of you heard the story that there used to be a TikTok right around the corner? Okay, from here. I used to like to go to TikTok. My parents, I told you they were both in the police department, well, they also helped started businesses over in Bayview. One was a gas station, one was an ice cream parlor. Well, I worked in the gas station, ice cream parlor, saved up my money, and I bought a car. I was 16 years old and had a brand new car. Okay? I took that brand new car, took my buddies, and I had some girlfriends over here about Balboa, so I wanted to help me get up, get up here. Okay? So I'm driving from Bayview over here to Bow, and then I got a friend who was going, living in Lakeview, but he went to Woodrow Wilson, and he told me that, you know, we need to do this party. So I'm being the entrepreneur that I am. I said, okay, yeah, we're going to do this party. Because I had done some other parties and been successful. I was kind of popular. I was popping up at Lincoln. I was popping at Washington. I was popping at Galileo. All these different schools. And I had a good time. But one night, I came over driving down Ocean, past TikTok. We went into TikTok, we got to these fries, we got this little sea burger, we got these cheeseburgers, all these little things. You know, you used to get a TikTok back in the day. And uh, we looked outside and we saw, you know those street barricade things, those things when they have construction and they got the lights on the top of them? With the flashing lights? Well, I'm talking about 1969, 1970. Probably 1970. Those lights were like disco lights, and we wanted to have our party. So, with my brand new car, I pull up, we take one of those street things off, we couldn't get the light off, so we took the whole thing and put it in the trunk. We went down a little further, saw nothing, took the whole thing, put it in the trunk. Now, anybody who has common sense knows I'm a pretty smart guy. I had to understand what I was doing. It wasn't legal. That's what you call a grand theft, felony, stealing. But I never considered myself a thief. I was just borrowing them. After the party, I was going to bring them back. Okay? So we got it popping in the party. We have all the, you know, just a great time. My father gets a call one day and it's a police department. They had written out my license plate. They knew where I was. And my father just played along with it. Brought me downtown, 850 Bright. I had my first encounter with the police. Here I am, 16 years old, trying to go to college, thinking all these positive things were happening in my life, and I did something what? Stupid. Okay? What did it say that again? It was what? Stupid. Okay? So how many of us who have sense, somehow or another, put it on the back shelf, walk out on stupidity, and do something what? Stupid. I could have changed my whole life, the trajectory of my life right then. But I caught, I got I got wind of it. I said, wait a minute, I can't, I can't go down like this. So I'm terrible. Mad. 
you know, he, you know, they let him go take me down and tear me all this other stuff. And then I realized all the things that I've done. I apologize. You know, I was gonna probably have to pay some kind of restitution. So, you know, he, he made sure that I paid a fine in house. But from there, that was 16 years old. The next thing I did had another track meet, and I uh, won the Junior Olympics in long jump, and I jumped about 22 feet. That's about from here to that where Doctor Diggs is. Okay, when I was 16 years old. Maybe maybe. I'll be with us at lunchtime, so you guys will be able to ask your questions and have this question there. We are in the home stretch. I know your classmates have had lunch, but they got cafeteria lunch. You didn't. So we have one more speaker before that stands between you and lunch. And so I'm asking that for your patience. The second speaker here, you shall see. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kia Wallace, who doubles as class. So she's a program manager at Westside um, Community Services, but she also doubles as a Balboa parent. So Keon is not in here, so maybe this will be better. That might have made it a little nervous, but Keon's still taking his senior portrait, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Wallace. Um, I actually wanted to do something a little different, so if you don't mind, I actually wanted to see just how much you guys in a circle and kind of give you my story and go over the things that I learned along the way. So if you don't mind, Guess what? Guess what happened? Ended up with nothing. Abused, 
I was 97 pounds, you guys, at 20. Sides, you know, you know how y'all see the little wings with the sides gone? Gone. No, real, real talk, from stress. Gone from stress. At 20 years old, stressed out with a baby. Sides missing. You think that dude saved me? You think he loved me? You think he cared about me? Not at all. Guess what ended up happening to him? He got killed. So guess where that left me? By myself with a baby. So guess what I had to do? I had to make a decision. I already gave up on one dream. Here I am with this little dream. He's looking up at me, I'm looking at him. Like, damn, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You crying, I'm crying, we all crying, we struggling. You little, I'm little, we're young. What am I going to do? Guess what I end up on? Welfare. That was the best decision of my life. Some people laugh at that, but back then, that's exactly what put me on the track to where I am now. If I would have never got on welfare, trust me, I could end up probably, probably while I've been in jail. Really, in jail, stealing, boosting. Yeah, that was me. <coughs> you know, you want to get, trade that money, trade them clothes in, get that money, open up that trunk, y'all want to buy it? No, that was me. That was me. That was me. No, for real, that was me. But, being on welfare, I had a worker who believed in me. She believed in me. She set me up on a program, a job readiness program, and it led to my first job at Westside Community Services. Mind you, I started at Westside Community Services in 2000. I left Westside in 2013 because I figured, you know what? I can't get no, nowhere else. I didn't have no college degree. I didn't have nothing. So I said, you know what? I need to go back to school. I ended up leaving my job, quitting. I had no other income. I quit. They said, I'm going to go to San Francisco State and do my degree in criminal justice. So I did that. The reason why I did that is because I like working with young people like you. I love working with young people like you because I love to see you in that moment where you're vulnerable and where you don't know what to do. You sit here with all these decisions, but you don't know what to do. And nobody was there for me. I didn't have a wellness center. I didn't have no you know, friends that really cared about me. I didn't have resources like you guys have here. I didn't have that in high school. And if I did, who cares? I'm not going to listen to you. I'm trying to go see what my boo is doing, right? I need to keep up with him. I didn't have resources in high school. You guys have resources right now available to you. Utilize those resources. So I left, I left work, graduated from San Francisco State, and while I'm doing little jobs here and there, guess who gave me a call? Westside. They called me. Kia, we need you to come back and do some Work and I'm like, well, how about I come back and do a better job than being a program manager? Since you don't have a program manager at one of your programs, they granted it to me. I worked with that company for 13 years, but I made a name in that company. I stuck it out with them. I created different programs within the company that serve young people just like you. I created a team center where we had teens coming to do their homework. They can come and just voice their opinions and share their frustration. I made, created and made programs just for you. So what I did was I took my lessons that I learned along the way and I tied it to some songs that you guys are familiar with right now. So I'm gonna read them off. And if you know the song, go ahead and sing the song. But uh, yeah, I do listen to the music that you guys listen to. I'm guilty. I know how to keep it lit when I want to. So I'm gonna give you guys my lessons I learned. I have and so when I name it off, if I say number, you guys say the number. Okay. All right. Number 10, irreplaceable. You must don't know about me. You must don't know about me. Okay? You are, irre you are irrepressible. You are unique. You are authentic. No one else can be you but you. Please be yourself. You're the only person that's best at being you. Period. If you don't be you, who will be? Anybody in here a twin? You are? You are? Aren't you different from your twin, even though you are a twin? Yes. Right? You're still your own person. Number nine, track queen. Everybody familiar with track queen? <laughs> 17 but 38. <laughs> ladies, where my ladies at? Where are my ladies at? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
somebody's baby mama or baby dad. You're better than them. Yes. Relationships and sex will come at the time that it needs to come. Life is not all about that. Life is definitely not all about being somebody's baby daddy or baby mama. Want more for yourself. Want more for your family. Travel the world. Go meet new people. See things. Experience things. It's more to life than sex. So I don't want to hear like, if I hear somebody walking down the hallway talking about Keon, can you be my baby daddy? <laughs>
want to cry all the time? Well, it's my life story. You know, um, I had instructed my son to take part because I did not want him to be with his friends and he was over age if they were going to drink. I didn't want them to drink and drive. So I had instructed him to take part. And so he was like, oh, mom, we're going to drive. And then he said, no, mom, we're going to listen, we're going to take part. And that's what he did. And so the first message is, um, just piggybacking on what the sister said, it's important to listen to your parents when they give you instructions. No matter what the instructions may seem like, it's important. They're telling you from their experience, they're trying to give you the best counsel that they know how to give you. And so it's important to remember, if you don't remember anything else, it's always important to obey your parents because they see the greater good in you. And so my son, when he took BART and um, he was instructed to get off the train by the officers, one of the things that I know that he listened when he got off the train, and not only did he listen, but when he, they was giving him instructions, he was telling his friends, you guys be quiet, we're gonna go home, you know. It's gonna be over soon, just let them do their job and we're gonna go home. And one of the officers got aggressive with one of his friends, and my son did not like that. You know, we are a protector of our friends. And so he said, hey, he stood up after he had been instructed to sit down and said, we want, I want to talk to somebody who's in charge. And so the officer didn't like that when he was saying that to him. And the whole situation escalated. And so because many of you have seen the movie, I don't really need to go deep into the movie. But I do want to just say that it's important that you do, if you do see incidents, you know, where you are safe, you know, if you have your phone, you can record them. Um, with my son's, uh, what happened with my son, there were seven different uh, videos taken from uh, the incident of him being killed. But I do want to say that, you know, there is a Malcolm X grassroots that has calculated that every 21 hours, and even it's been recalculated that every 21 hours, an African American is killed by either police or military, and so, or security guard. And so what am I saying today? I say, it's important for us, as we have the opportunities in life to get this, the education that we're getting, to be able to go to college, to be able to get the jobs. It's important to focus on those things because what we are finding is, is that in the streets, our young people are being killed so easily and so senselessly. It's important for us to come back and teach our younger generation that it's important to, number one, respect yourself. Learn to love yourself. Oftentimes we're finding that we don't really love ourselves. But learn to look in the mirror and say to yourself each day that you wake up that I am somebody special, that I am created uniquely, that I'm beautiful. Learn to know who you are, to love yourself, and then your sister or your brother, your friend, whatever, your comrade, your homeboy, your homegirl, whatever you want to call them, learn to love them too and appreciate them for being who they are. Not being jealous because maybe they sing a little better or maybe they dance a little better, but being able to work with them and encourage them in their assignment and what they have been given to do in life. And so we find that oftentimes um, our younger generation and even our older generation have been jealous of each other and it's causing massive killings on the streets. But I want to say to you that you have been created uniquely different for a special purpose, for a special assignment. And so Oscar, even though he's not here anymore, he had a special assignment and a special purpose. One of the things that I know that the Lord had showed me some time ago is that we would be in ministry together. And even though Oscar is not here, we are still in that ministry together because his life is still speaking values all over the world. And how do, why do I say that? Because when you think about the mass movement that Oakland has had that has broke out all over the uh, United States, oftentimes you will hear you know, the movement of how Oakland was able to rally together and seek justice for my son. And so 
the first time in California history an officer was charged with an on-duty shooting, and that was one of my, son, my son's case. Even though he was only given 10 months in county jail, which are African-American young men, when they sell drugs on the street, they go to prison. They don't go to county jail, they go straight to prison. He was only given 10 months in county jail, and then he was released. But it was the first time in California history that that happened, so that embarked you know, a fight within us to continue to fight that other officers are held accountable for their actions. And so, what do we say? So we say that it's important to know who you are, it's important to know your rights, but know when to exercise your rights. Because there is a time to exercise your rights, and there's a time not to exercise your rights. Meaning, because you maybe have an encounter with an officer, it's not always um, correct for you to be objective and to be disrespectful to the officer. So you have to know when to exercise your rights as a citizen. And so in my son's case, I have had an opportunity to travel all over the United States with mothers who have lost their loved ones. And even this month, my son would be 30 on the 27th of February. So the mothers are coming and fathers are coming from across the country. And so one of the things that we have um, endeavored to do is to go back into our communities and work with our youth to say, you know what, you are somebody, you know. No matter what society says, how society has deemed for our young men to go into the prison system, no, you don't have to go into the prison system. You can be better than that. You can get your education. You can own your own business. You can be who you were created to be because you are valuable. And so we have to get that message across. And that's one of the things that we strive to do all the time, to let our youth know, to let each of you know that you are valuable. Contrary to what society has said about us, you are valuable. Con contrary to what society has said about our African young men, that they are basically more like pet bulls, you are not like pet bulls. You are created uniquely different, and you have your gifts and your talents and your abilities that no one else can do what you do the way that you do it. And so in dealing with what happened with my son, and what do we do? One of the things that I charge people to do is be that creative person that you are. Be that creative person, because you have a special gift that nobody else can do but you. And so when Oscar and I was together for our last day, which was my birthday, the 31st of December, one of the things we laughed about is that I was cooking some gumbo. And so he was saying, oh, I'm gonna cook some too next time, right? And so we, we laughed about that because it's important. I said, Oscar, you know what you've been taught. And we had a whole long conversation. And one of the things that struck me about Oscar when he was killed is that his last picture on his cell phone was him being able to take pictures of the officer who killed him pointing his taser at him. And so what that was saying to me was that no matter what they said and how they said it, the officer knew exactly what he was doing when he shot my son. And several other um, reasons I say that is because when he even signed the court documents of the shooting, he had a option to put that he accidentally discharged his firearm, but never did he do that on his paperwork. And so when, so what am I saying? When we as, when you young adults get older and you have to go into the court systems and you become lawyers, judges, or whatever you have been gifted to become, it is going to be up to you to help to instruct the younger ones to begin to vote, begin to lobby for rules to be changed or laws to be changed, begin to not only vote, but begin to go into the jury pools, because none of us, is, a lot of us do not go into jury pools as African Americans. A lot of us as African Americans do not vote. A lot of us do not want to be involved in the court system. And we really need to get involved in the court system to change the way our society thinks toward about us as African Americans. And so I want to encourage you today. 
and I know I only have 10 minutes and I won't take too much time, but I want to encourage you today is to get into the court systems, learn the laws and regulations of this land, and not only get into it, but become voters, become lobbyists, work to help change our laws, become judges, work to render cases fairly and not um, the way society has set up for all of us to go into the prison system because we are the only ones that can change who we are as a people. And so as we work together and as we encourage one another and as we build on each other, then we, we will see our society changes when it, when it starts right here with us as the individual, learning to love one another, learning to love ourselves, and learning to encourage each other even in the down times. And again, I say to you, Never forget, again, as the sister said, never forget where you came from, the parents who raised you, because they, in turn, will get older, and they will need your assistance as well to help them. And then as you are getting older, you can help others be who they have been created to be. Thank you. That was the mother of Oscar Grant. So give, give yourselves a round of applause. We made it. So what's in your lunch? So we did box lunches because we knew we were going to take time. So for lunch, if you are vegetarian, we might need to talk to the cafeteria people next door. But we went, I'm just saying, we went soul food, we went southern fried chicken sandwiches, potato salad, peach cobbler, and bottled water. So at your, at your tables, there are going to be table topics. And so what is meant to happen is that each table will have a speaker. Each table will have a speaker, one of our distinguished guests, or a faculty member, but I think we have enough guests that you can sit with one of our speakers. You can ask as many questions as you can, right? So there's some thought starters on the table. There's some thought starters here. We heard a lot of different things today. We talked about clap twice if you can hear me. Oh, oh, sorry, thought, as in T-H-O-U-G-H-T. That T is about the chicken thinking of not T-H-O-T starters, thought starters, sorry, sorry, that's that Midwest. <laughs> okay, that's all right. So there are going to be different things. Clap twice if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. So there will be different topics that you can talk about, things you heard. We've got some there. There's some other topics here. I'm going to ask each one of our speakers to grab their lunch and pick a table. That's how we do it in our house. We're going to let our guests eat first. Some of them aren't guests because they're alum and parents, but we're going to let our guests grab their box lunch and pick a table. Pick a table. The next Once our speakers get their lunch, I'm going to then dismiss the women. Okay.